let me recall what we did last time. So uh, we considered so-called perfectoid fields. And let me recall that a perfectoid field is a topological field K. Uh, whose topology is induced by a non <coughs> non discrete variation of rank one <coughs> uh, such that the residue field is finite residue uh, is of characteristic p <coughs> and such that the Frobenius is surjective on K0 mod pi. Uh, so let me recall that K0 was the power bonded elements, which is a set of all x, absolute value at most 1, using this rank 1 variation. And in there we have the maximal ideal, which is also a set of topologically new potent elements. And it's also the set of all x of absolute value less than 1. And <coughs> last time we constructed a functor called the tilting functor from any such perfectoid <coughs> field to perfectoid field of perfectoid fields of characteristic p. And Notes that in characteristic P, the condition is basically that this complete non Archimedean field be perfect. And <coughs> so some of the theory is much simpler over this uh, characteristic P field, and we are trying to compare the two somehow. And so let me call the description of K flat. So it's inverse limit over the piece power map of R, for example, uh, of K. And uh, and somehow if you consider truncated versions of the power bonded elements and they become isomorphic so so pi and pi flat where it's chosen to be some corresponding uniformizers and, and so this was, some, was summarized somewhere in the following picture so here's this is spec k0 with its generic point and its special point and some infinitesimal thickening which is the spectrum of this reduced thing. And then somehow we have the tilt, which somehow starts the same, but then somehow goes on differently in the spectrum of k flat naught. And uh, last time I stated the following theorem that there's uh, the tilting function L maps to L flat induces an equivalence uh, between the finite etal extensions of k and of k flat, so that in particular the absolute Galois groups of the two fields will be canonically isomorphic. And implicit here is the statement that any finite extension of k will again be perfectoid. <coughs> and the plan of proof for this was uh, to use some almost mathematics, so recall that we define the category of almost k naught modules as k naught a modules, which was the category of k naught modules, where you divide out by the six subcategory of m torsion objects. And this was possible because we are in a non discrete valuation, and hence the square of the maximal ideal is equal to itself. <coughs> okay, and then we defined notions of k naught a algebras and so on and so forth. And the refined version of the theorem is then that we have the following chain of equivalence of categories that somehow these finite etal extensions extend almost to the integral level. And somehow then there's a lifting theorem stating that one can lift finite etal, etal extensions over such, uh, over near potent elements, and then we can go to the other side because of this isomorphism of the truncated rings.
<coughs> and so part of this long equivalence of categories will generalize to a more general setup, which is a um, the setup of, of perfectoid algebras. And this, these I will introduce now. So um, first over k, so a perfectoid k algebra is a Banach k algebra R. And then the first condition is of a topological nature, saying that the ring of power bounded elements in R is it's always open, but the condition is that it's bounded. And uh, then comes sort of the perfectoid condition, which says that um, reducing mod pi uh, is surjective. <coughs> As the Frobenius mod pi is surjective. And so let me remark that sort of in the classical setup of rigid geometry, one also considers Banach algebras. <coughs> and this condition that the, the suffering of power bounded elements is open and bounded is precisely true for um, reduced algebras, but this condition will basically never be the case. <coughs> so the second is then over. the almost integral level. So there it's a flat and pyrolytically complete um, k not a algebra a such that, again, modulo pi, the Frobenius should be surjective. But now we additionally require that the kernel is generated by the piece root of pi. So we, it was possible to somehow choose these uniformizers to be equipped with a canonical system of p to the n's roots. <coughs> and the last point, so no, also the reduced version, perfectoid k not a mod pi algebra is a flat. Um, K not a mod pi algebra a bar. <coughs> and then we again put this condition about Frobenius such that Frobenius uses such an isomorphism. Okay. And then we have the following series of equivalents of categories. So let me denote by k perf. Uh, the category of perfectoid k algebras, and then we have k perf is equivalent to k not a perf. Then it's equivalent to k not a mod pi perf. And once we have this, then this will be just the same as on the other side again. And then we can lift to the other side. So the proof splits into two parts. So first we have to prove this equivalence and then this. And <coughs> at the first step, let me explain what some of the conditions imposed on such a perfectoid k not a algebra mean. So we put the condition that is flat and pyrotically complete. And so let me explain what this means in in classical commutative algebra. So let M be a k not module, almost module. And recall that then we had defined this module M lower star, which was the homomorphisms in this almost category from k not a to M. And so this is a k not module. And in fact, it's, if we take the associated almost module, we get back M. <coughs> So the first condition, the first part describes the condition uh, when M is flat. So M is flat if and only if M lower star is flat, if and only if M lower star has no pi torsion. <coughs> uh, 
And oh, let me recall that this thing here is uh, called, uh, called uh, it's a module of almost elements of M. And uh, for the following reasons, this is a good name. So assume M is the almost module associated to N. And N is flat, so flat K0 module. Then <coughs> um, uh, the, the, the almost elements of M are described in the following way. It are the elements x in N invert pi, such that for all epsilon in M, the epsilon multiple really lies in N. So some of it are not really elements of N itself, but as soon as you multiply them by something, in the maximum idea, they become elements. So they, in this sense, almost elements. And okay, so this basically explains uh, the flatness condition. And now we want to uh, explain what it means to be periodically complete. And <coughs> there we have the following. Um, so assume that M is flat. Then for all x in K0, um, one can compute what xm times lower star is, and it's just xm lower star, so that's OK. And secondly, one can wonder what m mod xm lower star is, and there it will turn out that it does contain this thing. But in general, there are more elements, and I will give an example in a second. <coughs> but uh, it's not so bad because for all epsilon and m, the image of m mod x epsilon m in m mod x m or star is just this submodule. And the last point is that um, again, if m is flat, then M is periodically complete if and only if M lower star is periodically complete. So in particular, the condition that this K0 almost algebra A is flat and periodically complete can be rephrased as saying that A lower star, which is an actual K0 module, is periodically complete and flat. Okay? <coughs> and so let me first give a remark about point three. Um, so recall that, for example, if you want to compute k0 mod pi lower star, then there was a general formula saying k0 a mod pi lower star. Then there's a general formula saying that this is a set of homomorphisms from the maximal ideal into k0 mod pi. Um, so more generally, if you have any module, uh, take its associated almost module and its almost elements, then this is computed by this formula. Take some homomorphisms from the maximal ideal into there. And so this contains, as already mentioned last time, elements of the form sum of uh, pi to the 1 over minus 1 over p to the i xi, where the xi are any elements in K0 mod pi, because if, as soon as you multiply by some small epsilon, this will just be a finite sum, which will then make sense. And so the problem is that these elements do not lie in K0 mod pi, which is subset of this in general. cannot lift them to elements of K0. <coughs> OK, so, but also we see that somehow uh, these elements will not lift any further because somehow there is this accumulation point somehow of the exponents here and they will lift, not lift any further and that's some of the reason that here in 3 we get this last statement. OK, and so let me give a proof of this. 
so for one, first we check that uh, if m lower star is flat, then m is flat. Well, that's easy because recall that m is flat means by definition that for all x k0 modules and i bigger than 0, that's the tor i of x and m lower star is almost 0. <coughs> but of course, if m lower star is flat, then this thing will be 0. So that sort of this implication is clear. Then the second implication is that if m is flat, then m lower star has no pi torsion. <coughs> How do we do this? So first note that, again, using this formula for the almost elements, it's the set of homomorphisms from m into m lower star. And this description implies that this thing has no almost zero elements. OK. Because m squared is equal to m again. And <coughs> so then we use that, as a particular case of this condition, we use that the tor 1 of m lower star with k0 mod pi, that this thing is almost 0. And this just translates into the condition that the kernel of multiplication by pi on m lower star is almost 0. <coughs> but again, uh, the kernel uh, can have no almost 0 elements because of this, and hence it follows that this thing is 0. And so, which means that m lower star has no pi torsion. And then there is the last step saying that m lower star having no pi torsion implies m lower star flat. But of course, this is just a standard in uh, statement in standard commutative algebra and uh, yeah. so, so standard effect. OK, so now for the second statement. Um, so again, we use this formula that m lower star can be computed as the set of homomorphisms from the maximal ideal into n. And because n is flat, this embeds into the homomorphisms from k into n invert pi. <coughs> and how do we describe these homomorphisms that lie in the image? So the homomorphisms are given by the element of 1, which is an element in n invert pi. And the condition is that as soon as you multiply by some epsilon in m, you, you have to get an element of n. But that's just what we claimed. Uh, the third point, um, if M is flat. Exactly. So, so uh, we write x m lower star. We can write it as the set of elements in y in uh, what's the best way to say this? m lower star and word pi, such that for all epsilon and m, some of epsilon x epsilon y plus x times m lower star. And this can be rewritten as the set of all x times the set of all y in m lower star pi inverse, such that for epsilon and m, epsilon times y lies in m lower star. But using the what we proved in part two, for the special case of n equal to m lower star, this is just x times m lower star. 
And because m maps to m lower star is uh, left exact because it's right adjoined to something, uh, we now get that m lower star modulo x m lower star lies in m modulo x m lower star. And uh, so, okay. Uh, Last assertion is left as an exercise. <coughs> and for the last point, part four, we note first that both functors m maps to m lower star and n mapping to n almost uh, admit left adjoints. Uh, giving the second case by the functor that I have not yet introduced, which is m maps to m lower star, which is uh, m lower shriek, which is m tensor m lower star. Um, and hence commute with inverse limits. And so in one direction, we then get that if uh, If m is pi equally complete, then m lower star is the inverse limit of m mod pi to the n lower star. This commutes with inverse limits, so it's, it's the inverse limit of m mod pi to the n lower star. And <coughs> now we want to see that this is also the same as uh, the inverse limit of m lower star mod pi to the n. <coughs> So a priori, we would think that this might be only an inclusion because we only have this inclusion. But we require that somehow we have in elements in this inverse limit. And so everything that occurs in this inverse, inverse limit has to live to something larger. And then we use this statement here saying that then it actualized in this sub-thing. So and for the other direction, it's even simpler somehow. And so now we can prove some propositions. <coughs> uh, the first is that um, if we have a, a perfectoid K algebra, <coughs> then uh, phi induces, in fact, an isomorphism between R0 mod pi reduced mod pi to the 1 over p with r naught mod pi. So remember that we only required this phi to be surjective. And, but in all other rings, we sort of required that we have such an isomorphism. And sort of here, it's automatic. And also, uh, if one considers the almost algebra associated to r naught a, then this is a perfectoid. K not A algebra. Okay. And for the proof, just note that if X is an element of R naught such or X is an R, yeah, an R and R naught, uh, such that its piece power is an R naught, then it follows that sort of such as this thing is power bounded, then Obviously, x o divided by pi to the 1 over p is also power bounded, and so, which gives the first statement. And for the other note that uh, we know that r naught is uh, flat and pilotly complete. by the condition that it's open and bounded. And hence, by the previous lemma, we see that the almost algebra is also flat and pi complete. Uh, 
and sort of the last condition also translates into the almost setup. And okay, and now we want to so we can now pass from perfectoid k algebras to perfectoid k not almost algebras. And now we want to go the other way. And that's the following lemma. So let a be a perfectoid k not a algebra. And uh, let R be the algebra you get by inverting pi. <coughs> and we want to see that this gives you a, perfect, a perfectoid k algebra. So first we give it a topology. So with topology making uh, a lower star open and bounded. And then, in fact, the power bounded elements of the thing will just be a lower star. And so, in particular, we see that R, we can reconstruct A by taking the almost algebra associated to R0, which means that the two functions will be inverse. <coughs> and this also, then, by what's already on the blackboard, implies that we get an isomorphism between um, a lower star mod pi to the 1 over p and a lower star mod pi, which might be surprising at first sight because a priori only uh, uh, required it to be an almost isomorphism, but it turns out that it's an isomorphism automatically. And uh, R is perfect, right? OK. And so. Let's prove this. Uh, <coughs> okay, so first we uh, show that phi is injective. So, so first we know that phi, this map is an almost isomorphism by assumption, meaning that the kernel and co-kernel are almost zero. And so the first step is to show that phi is, in fact, not only almost injective, but injective. So what does this mean? So we have some x in a lower star, such that x to the p is in pi a lower star. And we want to prove that, um, <coughs> in fact, x lies already in pi to the 1 over p a lower star. But uh, almost injectivity says that this is at least true after multiplying by some epsilon. So, uh, uh, so for all epsilon in M, we see that epsilon times x has to be an element in pi to the 1 over p times a lower star. <coughs> But this means that this x is almost an element of pi uh, 1 over p times a. So it's in this set of almost elements. But then the last lemma tells us that this is just the same as what we have. So we get the desired conclusion. And the next, we need the following small lemma, that if x is some element of r, such that its piece power lies in a lower star, then already x lies in a lower star. And for the proof, we um, there exists some integer k such that pi to the k over p times x lies in a lower star by definition of r. <coughs> and if k is at least one, then in particular, we see that y to the p is in pi a lower star. And by the, almost inje by the injectivity that we have already proved, it follows that then, in fact, y lies in one pi to the one, 1 over p times a lower star, <coughs> which just says that also pi to the k minus 1 over p times x still lies in a lower star. And then we do induction to get the claim. OK. And <coughs> so 
So next we prove that uh, the power bonded elements are just a lower star. And for this note that it's clear that a lower star is contained in the power bonded elements because all the powers of an element of a star will lie in a star. And a star is a, by definition a bounded subset of R. And for the other direction, assume that uh, x be power bounded. And then for all epsilon in the maximal ideal, epsilon times x is topologically nilpotent. And in particular, there exists some big N such that epsilon times x to the p to the n will be an a lower star for n large enough. And this implies that epsilon times x is an a lower star by the previous lemma. And hence, <coughs> um, x again defines an almost element of a lower star. And hence, x itself, by the description of almost elements, is an a lower star. Um, and so now we have to prove that we have the following equivalence. <coughs> so in other words, we have to see that so A maps to A bar, which is A tensor, sorry, A mod pi. And so we have to see that A bar admit unique deformations. And for this, we will use the theory of the cotangent complex. So the foundations are of which are laid out in the thesis of Elusie. And let me recall a little bit about this cotangent complex. <coughs> So to so first in the classical commutative algebra setup somehow. So to any ring homomorphism R to S, we associate uh, the so-called cotangent complex, which is an element. You can consider it as an element in the derived category of S modules whose cohomology is concentrated in degrees uh, in non-positive degrees. Uh, and some properties of this are that, uh, first of the H, I guess it's more standard to use homological notation, uh, LH naught of this thing is just the differentials of S over R. <coughs> And uh, for any R, S, T, one gets a triangle in the drive category of T modules uh, connecting, now I have to get this right, L, S over R pulled back to, from S to T goes to the cotangent complex from T over of T over R goes to the cotangent complex of T over S. And so some of this extending, extending the short exact sequence that one knows, some are from for just omega one. Okay. And uh, let me say one word about the construction of this thing. So. Uh, 
construction runs as follows. Uh, we will also somehow need this. Um, <coughs> uh, so first, you, you use the Dalt Kong equivalence, saying that this derived category of S modules with this uh, boundedness restriction is equivalent to the category of simplicial S modules, module weak equivalence. <coughs> and so instead of this thing in the derived category, we will construct some simplicial S module. And the way we do this is to uh, choose some simplicial resolution of S by free R algebras. So meaning uh, just a polynomial algebra and possibly infinitely many variables. And there's even a canonical way of doing this, if you like. And then once some of four, for such a polynomial algebra, it's easy to define what the um, associated cotangent complex should be. It should be just omega 1, and someone extrapolates from this case. So one sets L S over R to be the, simpli so the, the object in associated to uh, um, from omega 1 of this simplicial algebra, which then gives you a simplicial uh, stot module. And then you, uh, am I getting this right? Uh, yes. And then you tensor over this, this S. And so why are we interested in this? It's because of the following theorems So, uh, in deformation theory. So let R be some algebra, some ring, and I and R an ideal such that I squared is 0. <coughs> and so set R0 to be R mod I. And let S be a flat are not algebra, and we want to lift S to a flat uh, R algebra. And we are asking what the obstruction to doing this is, and what are the possible ways of doing this. And that's answered by the following theorem, uh, which says that um, there is an obstruction class in x2 of the cotangent complex of s naught over r naught with values in the ideal ten tensored up to s naught. And um, the possible lifts are a torsor under x1 of the very same objects and the automorphisms of one lift are x0 of the same objects. So in particular, for example, if the cotangent complex vanishes, then there is a unique lift, and it's sort of, there's no ambiguity whatsoever. <coughs> and uh, the second deformation result that we will need is that if we already have S and S prime to flat R algebras, and we are given a uh, homomorphism from their reductions, so are the reductions to uh, R not, and we are given a homomorphism from S not to S not prime uh, homomorphism of R not algebras. 
And we want to lift this to a homomorphism from S to S prime. And then there's the following, that there is an obstruction class in x1 of uh, the cotangent complex of S0 over R0 with values in S0 prime, tensor R0 i. And the possible lifts form a torsor under the group uh, X0 of the same thing. So again, we see that if the cotangent complex vanishes, then also homomorphisms lift uniquely. And so <coughs> it will be interesting for us to have a criterion for when the cotangent complex vanishes. And there's the following very nice proposition that also appears. So I learned this from this book of Gabba and Romero. And I don't know whether this was observed before. So there's the following very easy criterion. So if R is a perfect FP algebra, then the cotangent complex of R over FP vanishes. So, and we will need a slightly enhanced version of this. So, uh, let R to S be a morphism of FP algebras. Uh, let R lower phi be the R algebra R via the homomorphism we have the Frobenius, uh, and uh, in the same way we define S phi, and we assume that the relative Frobenius um, five S over R is an isomorphism between. Uh, even in the derived category between this and this. So that it's this isomorphism in the derived sense just means that it's without the L, it's an isomorphism and all higher Tor terms vanish. <coughs> and uh, then again, the cotangent complex vanishes. Okay. And So for example, the first statement <coughs> uh, can be used to say that the ring of bit vectors of R are just a unique deformation of R to a flat and periodically complete ZP algebra, which is somehow much closer to how I think about the width vectors than the usual definition. Uh, and also, some, uh, it's clear that the omega 1 of R over FP is 0. Why is this? So if X and R and x is y to the p, then dx is equal to dy to the p, and that's p times something, and this is 0. And that's somehow the crucial identity behind this proposition here. <coughs> and so we just have to slightly go for a slightly more enhanced argument. And so this goes as follows. So Um, so we choose the simplicity resolution, <coughs> and we'll um, 
So we also have sort of the relative Frobenius over R, which is a map from R phi tensor R S dot to S dot phi. And the assumption just says that this is a weak equivalent or a quasi isomorphism or whatever you call it. And <coughs> so we have two resolutions of S phi by a free simplicial S phi, R phi algebra. So on both sides of this give you such a resolution. And so it follows that they both compute the same cotangent complex, which means that R phi tensor R, well, L if you like, um, of the cotangent complex of S dot over R goes isomorphically to the cotangent complex of S without the dot, S phi over R phi. <coughs> But on the other hand, we can explicitly compute what does this thing here do on the differentials. So, so some of one part of this simplicial algebra is just some uh, infinite polynomial algebra in general. <coughs> then phi s k over r on differentials. maps dxi to dxi to the p, which is again 0. So it follows that this very same map, this is a, which is a quasi-isomorphism, is also the 0 map. <coughs> and in particular, both sides of this isomorphism have to vanish. And this is exactly what we wanted to prove. So. But that's somehow the same thing, just considered from a different point of view as the cotangent complex of S over R. OK, now we have to use this vanishing of the cotangent complex. But first, we have to sort of adapt the theory to the almost context. And this was also done in the book of Gaba and Ramiro. So they show the following that um, so if R and S are k naught algebras. Then if you consider the co cotangent complex of S over R, but consider it in the almost way, then again, this is an object of derived category of S almost modules. <coughs> and they show that this depends only on the morphism from Ra to Sa of k not almost algebras. And so <coughs> you get uh, get La A over B in the derived category of A modules for any um, Morphism A to B of K not almost algebras in this way. <coughs> and in fact, uh, Gaba and Ramiro define a slightly refined version of this cotangent complex, which actually is an actual module somewhere over an actual ring, but we will only need this almost version. And then the previous theorems stay true. Theorems about deformations C 
stay true in the almost world. And uh, we will then need sort of the following corollary of this vanishing of the cotangent complex, which is that if A bar is a perfectoid, K naught A L mod pi algebra, then the cotangent complex uh, of A bar over the thing uh, is zero. <coughs> and one way to reduce it to the case that was already handled is sort of, uh, it's enough to represent a bar by a flat um, k naught mod pi algebra R such that uh, Frobenius is an isomorphism from R pi to the 1 over p was R. And uh, again, because of these strange elements which appear in the, uh, so someone could try this, but this does not work. But uh, in this book, there's defined as a different way of representing a ring by an actual, an almost ring by an actual ring. So it's what they call a double lower shriek, which is you take a lower shriek, which was, I recall, maximal ideal tensor a lower star. <coughs> this will in general be flat already, so that's better. So this thing might not even be flat. <coughs> but it's not an algebra anymore of a K0 because it does not contain the identity. So we artificially sort of have to add the identity and sort of mod out M. And so this works. Oh. Don't want to get into the details here. <coughs> and I guess uh, one could also just uh, do the same proof somehow. Or is it possible? Which is not flat? Yes. Okay. Well, somehow, it, if it's not a zero thing, then it will be faithfully flat here somehow. So I guess. Uh, well, maybe I should check again, but uh, okay. And so, as a corollary, we now get that uh, the categories of K naught A algebras. Uh, did I write this correctly last time? The perfectoid K naught A algebras and the perfectoid. K not A mod pi algebras are equivalent. So uh, for the proof. So we need to prove inductively that A bar lifts uniquely to a flat K not A mod pi to the n. Algebra uh, <coughs> mm, what do I want to say? Uh, a bar n. And then A will just be the inverse limit of the A bar n's. And to see this, we have to see that some at each step the cotangent complex will vanish. Uh, I want to add the almost thing here. Um, and so we have an exact sequence. Uh, how does this go? Um, I mean, 
some easy verification somehow that this lifts. Uh, L A A bar N over K not A mod pi to the N. Yeah. And so this is zero, this is zero, and so this is also zero. Okay. Uh, okay. So finally, we get some of the equivalents of all of these categories. In particular, we get from perfectoid k algebras to k perfectoid k flat algebras. But some of the way we did it was completely inexplicit. And it's nice to know what this equivalence looks like after all. So we want to compare this with this Fontaine's construction. So let r be a perfectoid k algebra. <coughs> and uh, A be the associated um, K not almost algebra. <coughs> and then we define A flat to be the inverse limit over Frobenius of A mod pi. And this is A. Uh, k not k flat not a algebra via k flat not a as the inverse limit over Fabinius of k not mod pi. And, uh, and then we let r flat be the associated uh, thing over k flat. Uh, and, and then we have the following proposition uh, that r flat is really the tilt of r. And we have some more properties somehow. Um, our flat can also be described just as the as a set, as the inverse limit over the piece power map on R. <coughs> and then also the ring of power bonded elements in the same way. Uh, in particular, one sees that the construction is independent of pi because some, uh, the way we proved the equivalence, we somehow implicitly chose some pi. But for example, one can see from this description that it doesn't matter. Um, and somehow, again, we have the property that after reducing mod the uniformizer, the two things become uh, the same. And in particular, we get a continuous multiplicative map from R flat to R, which again is denoted X maps to X sharp. <coughs> and so the key point is just that <coughs> so somehow we have the series of equivalence of categories. K flat not A mod pi perf. And then we again lift to the other direction. And so if we start with this R, then this maps to A and this maps to A bar, which is A mod pi. So that's all easy. And some of the key point is that this lifting here from uh, on characteristic p from the stuff mod 
pi flat to the stuff on the integral level, which we somehow did with this vanishing of the cotangent complex and which was completely inexplicit, can somehow in this case be made explicit just by taking the inverse limit of the Frobenius. So reasonably easy. And uh, well, uh, some of all the other verifications are basically uh, standard. So uh, maybe I should say how to get this map from R flat to R. So we have some of more. Uh, It's easy to see this. And then we have the projection map again here from uh, the inverse limit over uh, <coughs> over the piece power map. And in the same way that it was proved for fields, one checks that again there's an isomorphism here. And <coughs> this then gives the desired map. And it extends somewhat to the rational level. <coughs> okay. And so one might wonder whether it's some of someone now we have dis described the explicit functor going from characteristic zero to characteristic p. And one might wonder whether it's possible to go the other way, and indeed it is. So But it's somehow, uh, the converse functor is given in the following way. So, so some converse functor S maps to S sharp is S sharp. So you take the ring of fit vectors of the power bounded elements in your characteristic P ring. This becomes an algebra over the writ of fit vectors of K flat node. And then in PAD cot theory, you define this map theta from the swing of fit vectors to k, and then you tensor along this map theta. And so I'm drawing a picture. This would mean that uh, so we we'll call this picture somehow. And <coughs> so we somehow did go went this way. And we showed that one can sort of invert both arrows. And <coughs> but this explicit function now goes somehow over this direction. So this is the explicit function. So it does not go over the special point, but somehow there is this whole s surface somehow in between, which is somehow the ring of fit vectors, or so a spectrum of the ring of fit vectors of this characteristic P ring. And so you first extend over this whole surface and then specialize to a different point. that somehow the explicit functors go as a circle. And it's possible sort of to give a direct proof without using any almost mathematics that uh, one gets an equivalence between these categories of perfectoid algebra. So, which is done by Kate Lyon. And here. <coughs> so some of the independently came up with uh, pretty much related ideas. And uh, after I told them that there is this equivalence, they sort of saw that it's immediate to deduce, them, to deduce it from their results. Okay. <coughs> so. Let me give an example now. So we have not seen any perfected algebra until now, so maybe that's <laughs> so one can, for example, take the following algebra, you take 
convergent power series in a certain number of variables, but you join all of the p-power roots of the variables as well. So by this ring, I mean you take the polynomial algebra over the ring of integers, complete it p-adically, and p-adically, and then invert pi. So this is perfectoid. And it still looks just the same, so still all flat. And uh, a very easy proof of this is to observe that first of the power bonded elements are really just the PID completion. of this thing, and that phi is surjective on R0 mod pi. So we see that it's indeed a perfectoid algebra. And to see that it's the two are tilts of each other, it's enough to see that R0 mod pi is the same as R flat not mod pi flat. So by how we proved the tilting equivalence, it's enough to show this isomorphism and this is clear. So because it's just the same thing. And of course, you could sort of do the same example for any toric, for any monoids of for toric varieties. Okay. <coughs> yeah. And finally, we want to somehow use all of this stuff to finally prove <coughs> this equivalence uh, of Galois groups on the two sides. So we need to prove something about fields again. And that's the following lemma. So that if R is a perfectoid K algebra with tilt R flat, and somehow R flat is a topological algebra, and it makes sense to ask whether it's a perfectoid field. And that's precisely the case when R is a perfectoid field. And <coughs> okay, so. <coughs> uh, mm. Proof runs as follows. So, um, so the rank volume valuation is necessarily given by equal to the spectral norm, which in our case can be defined as XR as the supremum overall, or the infimum overall. T inverse, where T is some unit such that T times X is in R0. And uh, uh, it's easy to see that uh, spectral norm on the tilted side can be computed by uh, taking the spectral norm of this uh, sharp representative. And <coughs> it's also easy to see that R is, perfect, is a perfectoid field if and only if this is multiplicative and R is a field. And because R flat is the in inverse limit of R, it follows that if R is a field, then R flat is a field. And somehow it's also true that if uh, this is multiplicative, then by this formula, this thing is multiplicative. 
multiplicative. So one gets one direction, and, and the other direction is also not hard, but so I leave it as an exercise. Uh, and so now we need to discuss the lifting of finite etal covers. So somehow do finite etal covers somehow be We want to show that if you have any perfectoid algebra in any of these settings and something finite etal over it, that again it is perfectoid. And the starting point is the following proposition. Again, it's very nice. Everything that I need is already in the book. Um, that if A bar is a perfectoid K not A mod pi algebra and B bar is finitely tall over A, <coughs> then B bar again is a perfectoid. Um, and for the proof, so that b bar flat over k naught a mod pi is clear because it's flat over a bar and a bar is flat over this. So the hard part is to show that um, the following is true. So that's the following theorem that. Uh, we have this, and we have the Frobenius map here. And we have this thing, and this is a pullback diagram. Hmm. <coughs> For some other vesicle, Commissions of algebra that might be well known, but so it also extends to the almost setting. And once one has this, uh, one easily sees that indeed the Frobenius does the expected thing. Okay, and so we get the following diagram. <coughs> uh, so, so we have some R corresponding to A corresponding to A bar, which is then the same as A bar flat, and then we lift this to some A flat, and then we lift to R flat. So. Let these be fixed somehow. And then we have all of these equivalents of categories. So in the middle we have some uh, a bar finite et al, a bar flat finite et al, and we have just seen that there are these functors. And recall that last time I stated the theorem to the effect that uh, one can uniquely lift finite et al covers over such algebra. So, so this is somewhere from last time. So we, in particular, we also get this functor here. And so on, also on the other side, so we have A finite et al. You know, have this functor. <coughs> and then these, of course, map to, by inverting the uniformizer to finite et al algebras, 
as a generic fiber. And the first op observation is that this diagram automatically implies the proposition that the outer upper arrows are fully faithful. <coughs> because this here is an equivalence and sort of one gets the same algebras here. So we have these inclusions. And <coughs> later we will prove that both are equivalences. So this is known as Faulting's almost purity theorem. Uh, I mean, so if I have um, B1, B2 in A finite et al, say, then I'm interested in the set of homomorphisms of A from B1 to B2. And so that's by the equivalence of categories. Yes. The proposition says that the equivalence of general fiber is uh, fully faithful. Fully faithful. Yes. Okay. So if I, I have two such uh, uh, algebras which are finite et al over um, A, and I know that then they are also perfectoid. And so. Because for perfectoid algebras, I know that going to the generic fiber is fully faithful. I know that we have this equality. And this is just what we wanted to prove. OK. And <coughs> What we will do first is to prove this almost purity theorem somehow in characteristic P, which is much easier than in characteristic zero. So, okay. Uh, so that's the following proposition. And again, it's already in the book of Gabo and Ramiro. Uh, so let K be of characteristic P. So in order not to write flat everywhere, I sort of assume that from the start, I'm in characteristic P. And let R be a perfectoid the K algebra. <coughs> and S finite et al over R. <coughs> Then because S is a finite projective R module, it has a canonical topology. And then it makes sense to ask, say that uh, S is perfectoid. And on the almost integral level, it's still finite at all. So this, this means that this functor here is uh, fully faithful, uh, essentially subjective. And, and there's the following extra thing that is uh, useful, is that, in fact, this thing is a uniformly finite projective R, not A module. So in particular, there's a good notion of the rank of this extension. And so there's a good notion of speaking of the degree of some finite et al extension here. And so let me give the proof. <coughs> so, so S obviously is a perfect 
Can you bunna hold it, bro? <clears throat> and but it is, that does not yet mean that it's perfectoid because we have to show that the set of power bounded elements is bounded. And so how do we do this? So let S not in S be a finitely uh, finite R not subalgebra. <coughs> so it's possible to choose one uh, such that um, uh. okay. And <coughs> let S not bot in S be the the set of all x in S such that trace S over R of x with values S in S not as values in R not. So here we use the trace form of S over R, which is a map from S tensor R S to R. <coughs> It was uh, last time introduced in the context of almost algebras, and of course, it exists also in, also in usual commutative algebra. And so this is a perfect pairing. And then it's easy to see that S0 and S0 bot are open and bounded. <coughs> and we claim that the power bounded elements sit somewhere in between. So we let uh, what was my name for it? Y is the integral closure of R0 in S. And then, first of the trace form pairing, on Y takes values in R0. And it's also clear because uh, this is a finite algebra that all elements in there are integral. And by this property, it follows that it's somewhere squeezed in between S0 and S0 bot. And so it follows that Y is open and bounded. And But somehow using the arguments from the beginning, it's easy to see that the integral closure of Y is almost the same as uh, the power bounded elements. Because uh, if you have a power bounded element and multiply it with some small epsilon, then it becomes topologically topologically nilpotent and hence integral over the thing. And so it follows that S0 is open and bounded. So we know that this algebra S is perfectoid now. And <coughs> uh, now we have to see that there exists some n such that for all epsilon and m, there are maps to R0 to the n, and the other way around with composite equal. Uh, multiplication by epsilon. For this will imply then that S0 is a uniformly finite projective R0 module. Uh, S0 A. Uh, which is part of being some of this, the assertion. And <coughs> how do we construct this? So uh, now it really comes a crucial argument. So there so let E in S tensor RS be the idempotent, showing that S over R is unramified. And then there exists some big N such that pi to the N times E is an S0 tensor R0 S0. <coughs> but because Frobenius is bijective, it follows that for all 
epsilon and m, in fact, uh, epsilon times e is in this thing. So somehow, a priori, we only know that sort of it's true that up to some power that it is sort of unramified, but then sort of we can lift it almost to the integral level because Frobenius is bijective. It's really the crucial argument. And uh, we write epsilon times e somehow as the sum of xi tensor yi, where these xi and yi are in as not. And no, no, it's not. So I'm not passing to almost stuff. Mm -hmm. So we have these. And if you think about it for a second, then you see that you can choose this n somehow uniform for all epsilon, somehow by taking one expression here and then taking just the piece roots out of it. And then we get maps from S0 to R0 to the n, sending S to the tuple. Uh, what? Y1. And we get a map in the other direction, uh, sending R1 up to Rn to the sum of a i r i, and uh, it's easy to see that their composite is multiplication by epsilon. So this way we see that S naught a is such a nice module over R naught a, and um, what's left to see is that S naught a over R naught a is unramified. And, but, but we have already seen that uh, E defines the required uh, almost idempotent somehow. So here we are. Yes, sorry, yes. I shouldn't change notation from my notes. Okay. And so it follows that the diagram here extends here to an equivalent. And in particular, it follows that there's also this arrow here. Or we have just proved it that they are all perfectoid. And also another. Uh, to extract the, at this step, because to have the Frobenius. So somehow, once you have the Frobenius, somehow really, not mod p, but really on the ring itself, sort of you can really make this argument that somehow something is true up to some pi power, then it's really almost true already. This argument is much more difficult to make uh, for perfectoid stuff in characteristic zero. And usually one has to work much harder to prove the same theorems. But somehow amazingly, they all stay true. <coughs> yes, uh, you can sort of, uh, it's easy to make, to make this explicit what it means. And I guess it's what also a little bit stronger because you didn't assume that it's perfect. But I have said it's complete. But, okay. uh, it also follows that somehow in this picture, all finite etal algebras are uniformly finite projective. In this picture, um, 
So it makes in all settings uh, sense to talk about the rank, uh, the degree of some finite etat extension. And so, as a final theorem for today, I want to finish the proof of um, this equivalence of Galois groups, which is to say that the only step left is to show that this very leftmost arrow there is an equivalence. And uh, oh, maybe I sh first I collect something. So I want to collect sort of what we proved uh, for perfect dot algebras in characteristic zero. So now assume that then there is a fully faithful functor. from the finite etal algebras over its tilt to the finite etal algebras over itself, which is inverse to the tilting functor. And <coughs> the essential image are those S in our finite etal such that S is a uh, perfectoid and S not A is, and this extends to the almost integral level. Uh, and so in this case, if this is true, it's also true that S not A is uniformly finite projective. Over R not A. Okay. And then the final theorem is that uh, Uh, if R is a perfectoid field, then this functor is in fact an equivalence. Okay. And for the proof, so we can assume that uh, K R is K. So <coughs> can just rename our k as this perfectoid field R. And so, so it has a tilt k flat. And so the idea is now that um, if k is algebraically closed, then we already proved this last time. And so we reduce to this algebraically closed case. So, um, so consider M, which is the algebraic closure of k flat hat. And then M is a perfectoid field. So it's perfect and complete. That's enough to see. Uh, and so, in particular, it's a perfectoid K flat algebra, and so we can untilt it. So we get an untilt M sharp, which lives over K. And this is again a perfectoid field uh, by the proposition that somehow uh, tilting it identifies the perfectoid fields. And it's algebraically closed by what we proved last, last time. <coughs> and so for any finite extension, L of k flat, so L is contained somewhere than an M. We get some, we can go in the other direction, get something over k. And we let N be the union over all L of these L sharp things, so it's contained in M sharp. And it's easy to see that this is a dense subfield. <coughs> so because you know that modulo pi, some of the tilt and the ring itself are the same, so modulo pi you know that these are basically the same and then follows that they are dense. <coughs> 
And then uh, if somehow such a field has algebraic closed uh, completion, then it follows by Krasner's lemma that and itself is already algebraically closed. So in this setup, some are algebraically and separably closed are the same. And so what we get is that any finite extension f of k is contained in L sharp, where in some L sharp, where we can assume that L over k sharp is some finite Galois extension. But tilting preserves automorphisms and degrees. So that's somehow the reason that I paid attention to this uniformity stuff, so to see that it really preserves the degrees. Um, so it follows that. R sharp is again Galois. And so this f contained in L sharp corresponds to some subgroup of the Galois group of L sharp over k, which is the same as the Galois group of L over k flat. And so this corresponds to some f flat over k flat. And <coughs> then we have really have that this thing will give rise to our f. So because we have the equivalence of categories. OK, and uh, here we are. <laughs> okay. So we have proved this almost purity theorem for fields. And uh, of course, I mean, it was, was a little bit, I mean, it would be. Easy, one could give easier proofs for this, but this uh, comes naturally also out of the theory. Okay, that's it for today. Yes, so some, uh, because you have this equivalence of categories, it's true that f flat sharp will be fixed by the by by the subgroup so it's contained in f which are the invariants and because they have the same degree again it follows that they are equal Yes, 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 yes. So somehow you get this finite subgroup. This also exists on the other side because you have the equivalence of categories. And this, again, by Galois theory, gives you some finite extension. And if you untilt it, then by the equivalence of categories, the elements in there will be fixed under the subgroup. So it must be contained in F, but they have the same degree, and hence they are equal. Uh, yes, so yes, uh, I need that the field is Hanselian, but it is so somehow as a union of complete extensions. <laughs>